On the one hand, a rich and powerful tetrarch. On the other hand, a humble prophet. A birthday celebration in honor of the king of the region, the tetrarch of Rome, Herod Antipas, is having an ostentatious celebration of his birth. He invites family, friends, persons of high esteem. The food is impeccable, the wine flowing. There's lively music. It is the very symbol of opulence and decadence. Sounds lovely, does it not? It triggers our desire for pleasure. I mean, who doesn't like a formal banquet with rich, wonderful food and flowing drink, the laughter of many, and great music? This is actually what precedes our gospel message today. You see, Herod Antipas, the Roman tetrarch of the region, the king of Galilee and Perea, he is married to a woman named Herodias. But Herodias is, um, yeah, also his niece. Oh, and did I forget to mention, uh, she's also married to his half-brother, Philip. Herodias had a daughter, Salome, who is Herod's granddaughter. She's dancing for Herod's company, and he's well pleased with what he sees. He decides to offer anything he wishes and makes this an oath in front of the company of his guests. A little backstory before we get to his promise. You see, Herod has John the Baptist imprisoned because John condemned the adulterous acts of Herod and Herodias for taking his brother's wife, especially since Philip was still alive. In fear of an uprising of all of John's disciples, Herod decided to imprison him instead of killing him. Herodias wants him dead. Not only are their lifestyles lustful, self-centered, and debaucherous, but they are so enraptured with their lifestyle choices that they defend what they are doing, even to the point of having John imprisoned. How many of us defend our sinful life choices? Now to the promise of Salome. Salome is now prompted by her mother Herodias and decides to ask for the head of John the Baptist on a platter. The rich, powerful Tetrarch is more concerned with his self-image as being a man of his word in front of his guests rather than doing the right thing. He decides to grant her wish. I mean, what wonderful banquet wouldn't be complete without the severed head of a prophet? You may be wondering at this point, did Pete prepare for the wrong gospel message? I did not, but this is the background that leads into where our gospel message begins. Jesus hears the news of John, his cousin, the one who leapt in Elizabeth's womb when the pregnant Mary visited. John, the one who is called the prophetic Elijah to come, the one who led the way for the Messiah, Jesus the Christ. I can't imagine the grief Jesus must have had upon hearing the fate of his beloved cousin. However, he does something truly wonderful that displays his full humanity. He wishes to be alone, and he travels to a desolate place to grieve alone. On the one hand, we have a lively banquet celebrating the birth of Herod. On the other, we have Jesus grieving the death of his cousin. However, Jesus is not alone for long. News of his journey comes to the people, and they follow him to where he is. In another account of the gospel, it states he looks upon these people as sheep without a shepherd, and he has compassion on them. I don't know about you all, but when I'm grieving, it's very difficult to think about the needs of others, forget having compassion on them, and let alone what this word actually means in the Greek. 
You see, the word compassion in the Greek is splagnizomai. In our vernacular, we might say that our heart ached for someone, but in this time in the Greek language, splagnizomai means his guts, his inside, have burst forth in compassion. There is no stronger word for what Jesus felt for these people. He was so overwhelmed with compassion that he could do nothing less than take care of their needs while he was grieving. So Jesus takes care of their sick. He heals all who come to them, and he stands there and teaches them by giving him them his word. On the one hand, we have a rich and powerful ruler celebrating with the elite class of the region. On the other hand, we have the poor and the needy, the sick and the lame, seeking Jesus. The apostles begin to tell Jesus, yes, tell him. They do not seek his counsel or ask what they should do. They tell him to send the people away into town to get food because it is late. Jesus responds in turn that the crowd should stay here in this desolate place and the apostles should feed them. Yet they only have five loaves of bread and two fish and again tell Jesus it is impossible. Impossible. Impossible for the Messiah, the Son of God, who had turned water into wine at the wedding of Cana and who had just moments before perform miracles of healing for the crowd. Apparently it was impossible for him to feed 5,000 men, their wives, and their children with just five loaves and two fish. Jesus asked the apostles to bring him the bread and the fish without explanation. They do as instructed. On the one hand, we have a lively banquet with the richest foods. On the other hand, we have a humble meal in the desert. Jesus looks up to heaven and says a blessing, and then he breaks the bread and gives it to his disciples. Wait, I've heard this before. Yes, you hear it every time we come to this table. This is what Jesus did at the Last Supper. And the crowd ate. They didn't just eat. They ate until they were completely satisfied. The disciples took the bread and the fish to all who were sitting there, all 5,000 men, their wives, and their children. If each family had only two kids, which seems rather low for this day and age, that would be 20,000 mouths to feed with just five loaves and two fish. When the apostles were done, they each had a full basket left over, 12 baskets in all, one for each of the apostles who were serving the crowd. There was more food left over than when they had started, and yet tens of thousands of people were satisfied. You see, friends, with God, anything is possible. But more importantly, God takes care of our needs. Jesus didn't cry out and say, leave me alone, I'm grieving. He didn't even try to walk away from the crowd to be alone. He stayed with them. He not only stayed, he was bursting forth with compassion because of the needs of the people. On the one hand, we have a host who murders. On the other, we have a host who lovingly takes care of the needs of his people. At this table, we also have our needs taken care of. You see, this feeding of the 5,000 plus is a precursor to the Last Supper, which we remember right here every time we gather together and receive communion. We receive Christ, we receive him by receiving his body, and we receive him by receiving his blood when we eat the bread and wine at the table. 
On the night when he was betrayed, he took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to the disciples, saying, Take, eat, this is my body, which is given to you, this do in remembrance of me. In the same way also, he took the cup after supper, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink, all of you, this cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Jesus Christ, because of his sacrifice at the cross, in the shedding of his blood and the giving up of his body, atoned for your sin and your sin and all the sin of the world. He didn't do this out of some sort of duty. It's because he had splegnizomai for the broken. He bursts forth in compassion for his lost sheep in order to bring them back to the fold, to himself. He bursts forth in compassion when he defeated death and was resurrected and before he ascended into heaven and then gave his spirit to all of you. It is because of Christ's words that the bread and wine do become Christ's body and blood. When Christ was speaking to these 5,000 plus, he was giving them his word. And friends, you too receive Christ every time you come to church. You receive Christ each time you are here. You receive him in his word. And not just the readings we recite, but also the wonderful hymns that share his word. In fact, the entire liturgy is based on the word of God. The word is a powerful thing indeed. Through God's word, the bread and wine are also his body and blood, which we receive for the forgiveness of our sins. Through the word, God creates and brings forth life. On the one hand, we have one man's word bring death. And on the other hand, we have the true king of kings word bring life, forgiveness, and a bursting forth of compassion and grace upon all of you. This stark contrast of the wealthy and powerful king versus the true king of kings, Jesus Christ, makes it easy for us to say, he's the bad guy, and point to Herod. And how many of us are sitting here today that enjoy the decadent things of this world? How easy is it for us to be tempted by those things that give us pleasure? And again, how easy is it for us to look at one's own desires and not at the needs of those around us? When we have communion again next Sunday, let us remind ourselves of the level of compassion our Lord has for us by remembering the sacrifices he gave for a fallen and sinful world, to remember how God himself became born just as all men, to remember his self-sacrificing ways like how he was with the 5,000, to remember the extent of his compassion for us when he endured the cross and gave up his body for each and every one of you, and then defeating death through his resurrection. When you come to this table, be ever mindful of the spagnizomai of our God that he gave up his only begotten son so that your debt of sin could be paid and so that you may be co-heirs with Christ. The peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. <laughs>